morning, everybody, and uh, welcome back. So the uh, topic this week is to try to wrap up where we started last week with a discussion of uh, how we write a code for a neural network. So that's the essential today. And I'm going to remind you quickly of some of the examples which we looked at last week, where we just had one scalar as input and then a scalar as output. And we just had one simple node, or we could have one hidden layer with one node. And that gave us a very simple uh, set of equations. And then we looked at also how we could program that one. So the program example which you saw last week is something which can serve as an example for when you are building up your own neural network code. Now, yeah. Good. I don't think the sound is working. This one? Yeah. Okay. So this may be the, uh, it could be this one, which is actually a little bit. So let me just try. Can you hear now? What about now? Now it's better. Okay. Thanks. So uh, the idea then is to uh, build the basic equations which we need to program a neural network. And we are going to have an intermediate step before we set up the final algorithm. And that intermediate step, this step is a simple neural network with one hidden layers and two hidden nodes. So if you get the basic message and the basic equations which you see there, then it's easy to see how we can derive the final backpropagation algorithm, which, as we said last time, is nothing but automatic differentiation in a reverse mode. And one of the reasons why we do this reverse mode is that normally we have less variables in the output than we have in the input. So that means that when we start calculating derivatives, the dimensionalities of the object we are calculating the derivatives of are normally smaller than the input which we have. Typically, the input can be thousands of parameters in the design matrix. Okay, so just a quick reminder as well. Uh, the, uh, these lecture notes are those which you see here, but we also have some uh, videos on YouTube. And there are also the excellent lectures by Michael Nielsen. Uh, for the uh, learning session, the sessions, the lab sessions on Tuesday and Wednesday, uh, if you didn't finish these exercises from last week with the gradient descent, feel free to continue working on those. And then we are setting up an exercise this week where we are going to implement the feed forward part of a neural network. And if you find this uh, too easy, you can obviously start with writing a full code for a neural network. But this is meant as a kind of step so that next week in the exercise for week 43, we are going to have the back propagation part as well. So when you combine all these elements, you should have everything needed for setting up a code for a neural network. And then, as you may remember from the project, we are going to look at both a regression case so that means we can fit a function like the one we did in project one, or we can take a simpler function when you're developing like the one we are using for developing the gradient descent methods. So there is also a uh, set of notes uh, which you may find interesting. So this field about the mathematics of deep learning is actually a field which has exploded in the last years. So people are trying to give more rigorous mathematical statements about the mathematics of a neural network. And this is a, a very active ongoing research field. And now it seems that the system went down here for those of you who are in the audience. So we, uh, so let's see again what happened here. It's searching for the, uh, the, sometimes it goes down. So let's see here. Let me just uh, take a small break on the recording. Again. So the uh, uh, textbooks which you find here are those which some of them are textbooks which we have uh, been discussing throughout the semester. And uh, Rashka's textbook, as we mentioned last time, has also very nice uh, 
uh, introduction to how to write your own uh, code. And uh, this is uh, written in chapter 11 here. Now, what we did last week was actually to look at a very simple case, which we wrote diagrammatically like this. So we have some input X, just a scalar. And then we uh, had an activation function, which took in this input, which is given by this variable Z. And then it produced an output A, and this output is fed into a uh, cost function. And there we compare the output with the value which we want to reproduce, this so-called target value, which we call for Y. And then when we did the optimization, what we want then are actually the gradients of these quantities here. And uh, when we went through the, uh, the use of the chain rule, which is essentially what we end up doing when we look at the back propagation algorithm. That is nothing but the application of the chain rule. Now, the thing is that many of these networks are pretty deep, which means again that uh, we are going to have many, many derivatives to deal with. And if we have millions of parameters, we need to take the derivatives of millions of parameters. And that obviously slows down all training. So the uh, parameters which we ended up with, and I invite you to take a look at this because this is actually pretty useful when you are setting up your own code. So we get these uh, uh, derivatives in terms of the activation function, which is actually this quantity dA1, dC1 here. And you will see this equation here again and again. And normally, uh, we take the derivative of the cost function with respect to the output and one of these variables, which you see here, and call this for a delta one. And you're going to see this being applied again and again when we are setting up the final expression for the back propagation algorithm. So what we did next last week was actually to add an additional layer. So we have a network which looks like this. So we have a hidden layer here. This is the hidden part. And this feeds into the output layer. And this is the output, A2. And uh, A1 is now a, a label for the hidden layer. And you will see the labeling which we are going to use when we set up our own codes for neural networks is going to follow this numbering. So one, like this subscript here, uh, either as a subscript or superscript is going to represent the given layer. And in this case, we just have one input, one output from the hidden layer and one output from the output layer. So this uh, quantity you see here, the sigma two is another activation function. And normally in the training, what you will see is that the activation functions for the hidden layers, they are normally put to be equal, but then you would change the activation function for the output layer, because that one depends on the typical situation which you're dealing with. So later today, we are going to look at how we develop a code for a neural network or a classification problem. And then you will see that this activation function changes compared to what we have for a regression case. In a regression case, you would simply just spit out the value which comes from this sigma two of C2. And that is the value which you send out to uh, the cost function. And then again here, you have a set of derivatives but now we have to propagate backwards. So we start at the endpoints and uh, we get these derivatives of the activation functions. And that's also one of the reasons why we like to have activation functions, which have simple analytical expressions because they are easy to evaluate. And at the same time, they have to fulfill some specific properties, which we are coming back to. And then you go back and you get the next expression. And then you will see that you have also the derivative of the activation function in the hidden layer. And finally, this A0 is just the input, which we have labeled as X, but normally we put every uh, inputs and outputs, et cetera, from the network in terms of this letters A here. And uh, A stands normally from the output from the activation function. And then we have the final parameter, this bias, B1. And these biases are normally introduced in order to uh, avoid that the training may stop because the gradients of the parameters W may be zero. 
And then no, you normally would initialize the network with a parameter bias, which strictly speaking, if you just have one node, like this simple perceptron we discussed last time, this would correspond, it could correspond to the intercept if you're thinking of a first order polynomial. But the bias is often used now to avoid that the training may stop. Because if the weights by accident are zero, then the training will stop somewhere in the middle of your network. So uh, what one of the observations I want you to think of is that you see that these derivatives are very important because they, uh, if the function flattens out, this activation function, then the derivative may vanish. And that leads to the so-called vanishing gradient. Alternatively, if it becomes very large, we get something which is called exploding gradients. And these have been two common problems in neural networks. So for every layer and every variable, what you have now is a training in terms of the gradients, which we have here, this delta A1. And then uh, these biases are simply given in this terms of these parameters delta, which we have defined here, the delta 1 and a delta 2 which then collects some of these derivatives. So when you now uh, look at the next step, which is a neural network with two inputs and two hidden layers, then you will have essentially the, a repeat of the same thing. But then if you see the pattern, this is the same pattern which we will use when we now build up the full neural network. So let's take a look at the next case. And I'm going to skip the program here because we went through that one uh, last week. So take a look at this code example because you may find it useful when you're going to set up your own feed forward and your own uh, back propagation uh, part of the, of the algorithm. So some of these figures are a little bit blurred here on the Jupyter notebook, but you can fetch them from the original ones. Then, but now, I'm going to switch over to the whiteboard so that we can set up these equations uh, in a slightly more relaxed mode. But let me find my pointer. There we are. So what we're going to look at now is a uh, simple neural network, but which has the basic elements which you need to program, okay? So let's uh, uh, look at the input layer. So we have an input. And this input uh, is going to be given by an A0, and or A1, as we're going to call it, A1. And we normally label this, so this would be X1. And it's pretty common to now label this as an A1. And the zero here stands for the zero layer, the input layer. And then we are going to have a similar quantity here, which is going to be an A2 of zero. And this constitutes the input layer. So this is our X2 here. So this is the input layer. And then uh, the model which we are looking at now is going to have just two hidden nodes in just one hidden layer. So we're going to set up a new box here. And this is going to be the hidden layer. And it's going to have an activation function, which we are going to call a sigma one here. And this is sigma one, and it takes an argument C one. And then I have a new one here. I have to make them a little bit bigger. So the same activation function, but it takes an argument C two. And this one feeds in here, but it also feeds in here. So it's a fully connected neural network. Now, one thing you need to look at now is how you structure these unknown parameters, which we call for the weights. So the way I'm going to put this now 
is that I'm going to have a W11. So this is the unknown. And this belongs to layer, hidden layer one. And I'm going to have a W22 here for hidden layer one. And then I have a W21 for layer one. And this one is a W12 of layer one. Now then I also feed in here a bias for the hidden layer. There is a bias here, one for the hidden layer. And these two functions produce an output. So this function here produces an output, which I'm going to call A2 of hidden layer one. And this produces a new output, A1 of hidden layer one. And it feeds into a new function, which I'm going to call, call, call for sigma two. And this has a Z2 here. And this Z of layer two here, this is going to be given by weights of layer two. There is a weight two of layer two. And there's also a bias, which I'm just going to label as a B of layer two here. So this C2, which feeds in the new activation function, that is given by W1 layer two multiplied with A1 from the hidden layer plus a W2 from the hidden layer, now from the output layer times an A2 plus a B2 here. I hope you can all see this, uh, uh, these different variables here. And then this one, if we now continue, so we have to continue on the next image, this feeds out an output. So just let's wait a little bit so everybody have, has been able to write it. So if we then look at the output, this output from the uh, visible layer or the output layer. So this is now the, what you see here is the output layer. This produces an output, which we're just going to call A2 because it's just a scalar, just a number. And this goes into the cost function C and that receives an input, which is now the scalar number we want to compare with. So we have just two input variables, two hidden nodes, and just one output. And if you now look at the structure of the equations which we're going to set up, these equations contain essentially the basic setup of a neural network. So I invite you to take a look at the, the equations which we have and simply uh, go through them. Now, what we have now is a set of unknown parameters which we need to train. So we have this W11 for the hidden layer. We have a W12 for the hidden layer, W21, a W22. And this continues now with the biases for the hidden layer, a B2 for the hidden layer. And then we have an, a parameter W1 for the output layer a W2, and finally we have this B2 here for the output layer. So these are the parameters which we need to train. And you see now that even this simple case here has nine parameters. And that means that we need nine gradients. And the way we obtain these gradients is simply by the chain rule, nothing but that. Now keep also in mind now that if you look at the variables which we have, so we have now a uh, set of variables. Let's just wait a little bit so everybody has been able to write it down. So we are going to get this C1, number one, C2 for the first hidden layer. And that's going to be given by the matrix of weights. But now we have to be a little bit careful because if you look at the way I have organized or labeled these weights. That gives me a specific order. So just take a look at the naming of my weights. So when I have X1 goes to uh, 
this sigma one Z two, then I have to be a little bit careful with the way I put up the weights here because that has consequences for the matrices which I'm going to set up. So if you look now, what we have, we have a W11, and then I have a W, and now I have to be a little bit careful when I'm setting these quantities up here. So let's now just set one, two here, and then I have a W21, a one, but a W22, a one. But I have to take the transpose of this matrix, because if you look at the parameters which I'm setting up, so I have an A, one, zero, and then I have an A, two, zero. These are the inputs, X, one, and X, two, plus this vector of B, one, one, and B, two, or one. So if I look at C, one here, and you will see now that why I need to transpose that matrix, because that follows the way I have defined these parameters. So this is A10, but then I have plus W21, one of A20, plus this B1 of one. So this just follows the labeling I have done of the weights. So you have to decide for a specific labeling of the weights. And if you now look at the back, at what we had here, this simply follows from the fact that I call this W11, but the one where I, I feed this one in here is now given by W12 multiplied with A1, and this one, which now feeds into this variable, is multiplied by W21. But there is nothing which hinders you to just reverse that ordering. Okay? then you just have to be careful with how you define your matrices of weights and biases. This, the reason why I'm saying this is, is because this often leads to some confusion in the beginning. So going through this uh, two by two case can be very instructive uh, so that you don't get lost when you're setting up the final equations. If you now look at these uh, uh, equations here, the way I'm going to set it up is that we are going to have now a general C of a label J. So this could be a node in layer L. And that is going to be given by a sum over I equal one up to all the number of the inputs which I have. And these inputs M, they refer to layer L minus one. And they will have the weights. So this is going to be a Wij of layer L multiplied with Ia of layer L minus 1 plus this bias Bj of L. This is the general expression which we are going to use a little bit later when we now are setting up the derivatives of a neural network with many hidden layers. If you look at that expression, if you take a look at that one and go back to the previous one, you see that the, this one is just a special case of the general equation for this variable C. Then what we get next is that these variables, A1 of the first layer, these outputs as a vector, they are nothing but these parameters, sigma one of C one of layer one, the hidden layer. And then I have the same function with C two for the hidden layer one, like this. So in general, the way I have organized my matrix is that I need to put this matrix with the weights to be the transposed. But you should feel free to reorganize it. Okay, any questions so far? Does it sound okay? And these are the some of the basic equations which we now need to look at. And then we also have the final one. So we have these uh, equations here and the final C2 
for the second layer, since we only have one output, which is being calculated, this is going to be given by W1 of two times A1 of one plus W2 for the second layer times A2 from the first la hidden layer plus a B. And now I just put this equal to two because this is just a scalar. And then I have the final output which is simply given by the new activation function with C2 as an input. And then I can calculate the derivatives of uh, these expressions. And the thing which we are going to do now is simply to uh, set up the chain rule. And when we are setting up the chain rule, uh, this is something which we saw last time, we are going to repeat the exercises which we did previously. So let's now, uh, after you've been able to write down this, we are going to set up the derivatives. And with the derivatives, we can set up the gradient descent update rules. And then essentially what we have are the equations which need to be called it for that specific case. So normally what we have done in these exercises this week and also next week is that we've used this as a kind of intermediate step before you write your own code. Some of you have already written a neural network code. And so then if you feel more familiar with the formalism, you can jump into the final code for a full neural network. But we are just providing this kind of small steps here in case you have not written a code. And we know that by experience, by experience that it's actually easy to mess up with the definition of the different matrices and the gradients. So when we then start doing the calculations here, we are simply going to calculate the derivative of this DC of DWI for the second layer. So this is the first one we need. And that is simply going to be given by the cost derivative of the cost function of dA2, where we have only one output now, so that's the scalar. And this is dA2, and then we have a dC2. So these are all scalars, but in general, these will be now vectors or matrices. And then I end up with this Wi of two. And if we now have a cost function, which is the same as we looked at last time, so we can actually have that one to be given by the output minus y squared, then clearly we know that dc of d of a2 is nothing but a2 minus y. And then we know that this dA of two of dc2 that is simply going to be the activation function which we have for the heat output layer of DC2. And we label that simply as a sigma two derivative. So just keep these equations in mind when we now move to the general case, because we are going to have repeated uh, needs for using the derivatives of the activation functions. And just uh, feel free to break in in case something is unclear here uh, or if the uh, equations are not fully readable. So what we end up with then, if we look at this specific term which we have, this one, this is nothing when we go back now to the derivative of this quantity, which now in this particular case means one of these output variables. So if we go back then, then this one is just going to be A of I for the uh, output layer, which is now given, or the actually the input layer. So this is one here, that was a hidden, hidden layer. So that means that uh, when I look at this parameter DC, W, the, the weight WI of two, that is going to be given by, in this particular case, with the standard linear regression cost function, the mean squared error, it's going to be given by this expression here. And this is something you will find is pretty general because instead of the output from the hidden layer, 
This will be the output when we have a deep network. It will be the output from the last, the second last hidden layer, the layer before the output layer. And then you see also that this parameter B, if we now look at the, the definition, which we are going to see many, many more times. So I'm going to define this variable delta two here. That is simply going to be given by DC, DA2, and then DA2 of DC2 here. And then you, it's pretty easy to see that this DC of DB2, the only bias which we have, is going to be given again by uh, applying the chain rule of DA. And then I have a DC of two, and then I have a DC of two, and then I get a D derivative uh, with respect to the parameter B2. And this one, if you go back to the equation for C2, it's just one. So that means that in this specific case, we just get this delta two here. So this is the uh, uh, equations which we get for the first set of parameters, those which apply to the output layer. And this is normally when we implement the back propagation, this is where we start. So then, uh, since we now have gotten some momentum, we are going now to calculate the derivatives for the other parameters. So what we need next is dc of d w i j for layer one. And we need also dc of d of b of i of layer one. So these are the next parameters which we need. And what I'm going to do now is just simply to set them up because you've seen the basics here. So the only thing we need now is just to use the chain rule. So let's just do it for one of these parameters. And then you will see the pattern immediately. So what we have then is a DC of D W I J for layer one. And now we need to step back. So we take DC of D A of two here. So this is the same as before. And then we have a DC two here. And then we take a D C two. And now let's specialize one case here. So let's put I equal one and J equal to one. So let's just specialize to that case because what you will see then is that this one, if we now go back to the equations, we see now that there is a C1, which is given by W11 multiplied with A10 plus a W1 or 21 multiplied with an A20. These are the inputs plus a B1 one here. So if you now look carefully at that one, you see now that the, there is the dependence on W11. When we put I and J equal to one, that means that here I need to have C of one in the first layer. And then I get DC one. And this has now a D W11 for the first layer. So we know then that this is nothing but this parameter delta two, which we defined. Another thing which you will see now is that we can actually rewrite if we now look at this DC of two of DC one because that's the only one which has the W11 dependence. This is something which we now rewrite like this. And then we have a D of W11, and it's pretty straightforward to see that when we now break this down, because we, uh, what we're having 
if you look at the function which you see here, this one, this is something which we now can reuse the chain rule again. And we are going to have this one rewritten as a DC2 over D A1 1. And then we have a D A1 1 over D C1 1. And this quantity which you see here now, this is the derivative of the activation function in the next case. So when we collect everything here, what we are going to get is that this equation, which you see here, this one, this is going to give us finally an expression which runs like this. So let's just put it up here. I'm going to get a delta. So this is a DC of DW11 for the hidden layer. This is going to be given by a delta zero, or not sorry, delta one, which I defined for the hidden layer, multiplied with A1, one here. And this quantity which you see here is simply going to be given by a delta two, which we had previously, and it's going to be multiplied with a W1 from the second layer. And then I have my activation function, which is sigma one derivative. And uh, the quantity which you then can redo here is to, uh, so actually this is going to be defined like this delta one of one. And finally, I have to multiply it with the last equation which I have here. And this is an equation which applies to all the other parameters. So let's uh, now move back to the whiteboard, no, to the, uh, to the Jupyter notebook and look at all the expressions which we get when we collect the derivatives now. So let's do that if everybody has been able to write down the final term. And so if we now go back to the uh, screen here and look at the uh, Jupyter notebook, which we had. Uh, so let me just go back to, I just need to fix one thing here. So let me just do that and just share the screen again. So for those of you online, let me just get that properly here. And then we do a full screen. So when we collect all the expressions, so you will see again, there is a uh, the compact expression for the Z's. The outputs are here. And then we have the final output layer. And then we calculate gradually these different derivatives. This is for the output layer. And then uh, I have the next one, like this W11, the derivative respect to that one. And when we use the chain rule, we can actually rewrite that one in terms of, uh, so we have this ex last expression, which you see here, which the, we then can rewrite in terms of this uh, delta one, one, which we have defined here, multiplied with this uh, output from the uh, hidden layer. And then we would have the same for this layer. And we would continue like this for all the other parameters. So at the end, when we have collected all these parameters using the chain rule, then we would simply set up the uh, gradient descents algorithms and then train all these parameters by going backward in the network. So we would move from the output layer to the first hidden layer. And then when we have uh, updated these parameters using these different derivatives, as you saw collected there, then we have the update rule for the parameters. We get new values. And then we keep going till the cost function, which we have, reaches a determined convergence criterion, which we have defined. So that could mean, ideally, for the mean squared error, 
that this should be as close to zero as it can be. Now, after the break, we are going to generalize these equations and we are going to look at uh, the basic algorithm for setting up a neural network. And after that, we are going to look at uh, some technicalities and we will start by setting up a code for computing and running a neural network. So these equations, which you see here, this basic machinery, which is set up here, is the one which we will take with us after the break, where we now are going to set up a neural network with many, many more hidden layers. And that means that in this case, these inputs to a given node are now going to be given by a set of weights multiplied with the outputs from the previous layer. So this L minus one is now a previous layer. And this L, which you see here, I'm taking away the, uh, the parentheses just to avoid cluttering the equations and hopefully simplify a little bit the notation. And then you see now that the, this given value C is now given by the weights times the outputs from the previous layer plus these bias variables. So I normally always recommend, if you are a little bit uncertain on how to set up a neural network code, to actually go through this system with two inputs, two hidden nodes, and just one output. And if you then set up the derivatives and convince yourself that this is what they should be, then it's easier to actually move to the more general case. And after the break, we are actually going to uh, start here and we are going to simply use, for instance, like a function like this one, which is a sigmoid. And we are going to calculate the outputs. So this will be given by these functions as input. And then we are going to set up the final back propagation algorithm. And with that, we have basically the ingredients which are needed for setting up a neural network. So in a certain sense, if you look at what we are doing, the mathematics is pretty close to what you did in high school when you studied the chain rule. The difference here, obviously, is that we have uh, more complicated functions. We have to do an optimization part, which we didn't have in high school. So I don't want to sound like an arrogant person who says that a neural network is just nothing but high school mathematics. Uh, linear algebra is something which you probably did not have in high school, etc., etc. So there are several technicalities here, but the back propagation is you implementing the chain rule. And normally you start at the end point because the dimensionalities of the matrices and the vectors you end up with are much smaller than the input dimensionalities. And that's one of the reasons why we normally use the back propagation or automatic differentiation in a reverse mode or the chain rule in a reverse mode, which is actually more correct to say. So we uh, had a five minute break due to this uh, technical problem. So I suggest we just take a 10 minutes break, but it should be enough time for people to grab coffee, tea or whatever, and stretch legs and recover a little bit. I'm gonna stop the recording in the meantime. So what we are going to do now is to set up the final equations so that you can see what you need to program. Now, uh, if you look at the uh, definitions which we had before the break for just a simple example, what we are ending up with now is a variable C, which is going to be given by the, this equation here where we have the weights. And depending on how you define the weights and how you set up these multiplications, this means that you would either have a transpose of a matrix or not the transpose multiplied with a vector, which now contains the output from the previous layer. So L is just a given layer and L minus one is the previous layer. And here we are writing this in terms of a compact matrix vector product. So where Z now is a vector, it can be a matrix, so this is something you have to be a little bit careful with when you're setting up the dimensionalities. And we are going to see examples on how you uh, build up a general code for a neural network. There are two code examples. 
one uh, without any object orientation. And then there is one much more general at the end of the, this week's lecture notes. So feel free to take a look at this course. And if you have time, so we are not penalizing you in case you don't object orient. Also, if you don't have uh, had the time to implement Autograd or JAX, you will also not be penalized for that in the project because we know that many of you are pretty busy. So it depends very much on how much time you have. But the most important thing is you have, you have a working code for a neural network. And you can hard code all the functions you need because in our case, we are just going to have two types of training. So one data set, which is a binary classification problem, and the other one, which is a regression problem. And in those cases, the cost functions are only two, and it's easy to actually just hard code them. And then it's also easy to hard code the derivatives of these functions. In case you had problems in implementing Autograd or JAX alternatively, okay? So these are just some small technicalities about the project. And uh, we don't want to overload you guys because there are many things to do. So in case you're not too familiar with also object orientation, this is something which is pretty obvious to put in the conclusion when you describe perspectives for future work. So then clearly an obvious perspective then is, or future work is that if I had more time, I would have included object orientation. And that's fully acceptable. Okay. So uh, if we now look at these uh, uh, functions which we have here, uh, we are now going to specialize to the sigmoid function. And uh, uh, the figure which you see here is an example of what the layout looks like for the first layer. So we have the input nodes, and then we have the first hidden layer here. And the type of functions which we need to set up, the outputs from uh, the first hidden layer, is then given by this activation function sigma, which takes as input this matrix W multiplied with the inputs plus the biases. So let's uh, uh, slow down again a little bit and uh, take a look at the, the equations which we need to derive. There we are. And these equations are actually pretty similar to what we did before the break for this simple two by two case. But now the problem which we have is that we have many more parameters. So we are now going to have a set of parameters theta, which is going to be given by the output layer, which we label as theta L. Then we obviously have the parameters for the layer before that one. That's the last hidden layer. And then we have L minus two. And this goes all the way down to the first hidden layer. That means that this theta L here, which is the output layer, is now determined by a function W or this matrix W, which contains the weights, doesn't need to be a matrix, it could be a vector. Or if you just output a scalar, this is a much, much simpler equation. Now, what we also have is that this set J, which is the input to uh, the activation function, is now given by a sum over I equal one. And then we are summing up to the number of nodes which we had in the previous layer. So we have an ij of L. So these are the weights of layer L. And they are multiplied by the outputs from layer L minus 1. And then we have this bias parameter beta j of L. So in general, we would simply write this as a matrix L transposed, in my case here, an L minus 1. So A is a vector and B is also a vector now. And this L is now the label which represents the uh, specific layer which we're looking at. 
And then we also have this output from layer L, which is simply given by sigma Z of J of L. And in the examples here, I'm going to specialize to the uh, sigmoid function minus C of J L, getting many subscripts here. Now, again, when we are running the calculations, we are going to need a set of intermediate derivatives because what we are going to do is again and again the chain rule. So that shouldn't come as a surprise. So we need some intermediate steps. And if you now look at the equations here, one of the variables which we will need, and if you spool back to the example we had before the break, we will need a derivative with respect to this quantity. This is going to pop up. And if you look at the equation which we had, if you take this equation here, you see now that if I take the derivative with respect to a specific j and a specific i, this simply picks out this guy here. So that means that that one is nothing but a i of l minus one from the previous layer. Then I need another aid, aiding quantity, so with, which is going to be this one. And then I have a da i of l minus one. And that is simply going to be given by the weights with those specific uh, labels there. Then another quantity which I need, this is the output as a function of uh, this uh, z, the input. And this is actually the derivative of the activation function. And this is given by sigma of c j of l. And in this specific case, since we are looking at the sigmoid function, this is a j of one minus a j l, which is nothing but sigma c j l of one minus sigma of z j l here. Now, there is a reason why I uh, say this. If you remember from uh, last week, when we discussed uh, automatic differentiation, then when we calculate the derivative, what often, often happens is that we are calculating the function itself and some combinations of the function itself. So what you see here is that if you pre-calculate the sigmoid function and you look at the derivative, you don't need to calculate the function itself two more times because you have already calculated it. So if you take a look at what you have here, uh, you're going to calculate, irrespective of whatever happens, you need this one, but then you can plug it immediately in here in the calculations of the derivatives. So that's just a technical, a technicality when it comes to the numerical implementation, which saves you cycles. So these were just some intermediate uh, steps here. And now we just specialize to L equal uppercase L, and that is the output layer. So in the codes which you will find online, this is the kind of labeling which we are using. So that means that I have a cost function which depends on these unknown parameters. And in our case, this is now going to be given, and I'm taking away the factor of uh, one over n. So you would introduce that one later when you're calculating derivatives. and But you will sometimes encounter the mean squared error with a factor of one half instead of a factor of one over n. So I'm using this one now of just plain laziness because it gets rid of the factor of two when I take the derivative. But you will see that people sometimes define the mean squared error this specific way. And now this is just going to be a i l, this is my output, which then depends on the parameter theta l minus the target values like that. And this is something which we uh, will need to implement. And if you're using automatic differentiation, then you could simply just define the function and then calculate the gradients using that function. So if we now take the derivatives, so we would now need this derivative of wij of L, 
That is one of the derivatives. And if you look at the expression which we have, this is simply AJL minus Y of J. So we are picking one of these values of J and it's gonna contain, so this is J here. So we are picking a specific set of values and we have a D A J L. And then we have the derivative with respect to I J of L. And when we plug that in and we use the expressions which we had previously. So in the previous uh, no notes, which we had here, we will now need uh, this term and we will also need a term like this one and also a term like this one in the derivations which are coming now. So the term which we will need will actually be this one and that one. So let's now plug in these two expressions because we are going to need a D A J of L of D W I J of L. And that is nothing but D A J of L of D C J of L, which we already have set up the expression for. Like that. And if we collect the terms which we found previously, so if you now look a little bit closer to what we had in the previous expression, so let's just wait a little bit so people have time to write down. So if you look at what we had previously, we see, you see now that we can simply plug in this expression and we can plug in the expression which you see here. So if we plug these expressions in, then we are going to find the following expression for the derivative of the weights at the output layer. So if we collect all these terms, what we get then is, and then we are going to define an intermediate step here. So I'm gonna define a delta JL, which is going to be given by AJ of L, of one minus AJ of L. This is a derivative of the activation function. And then I have the derivative of the cost function minus Y of J. So this is nothing but what we labeled earlier as a sigma C of J of L, L. And this quantity here is just the DC DAJ L. And that means that if I now look at the final expression, which I need to bring in, then I have the CJL of WIJL, which is simply AI of the last hidden layer. So that means that I can rewrite DC WIJ of L as this parameter delta J of L multiplied with AI of L minus one. Now pay attention to uh, the fact that these quantities now can actually be written out in terms of vectors or matrices. So if I look at this term here, I can actually write it in a more compact way as just a vector delta. But then you have to pay attention to the fact that now we are just doing component time component. And it's not a vector times a vector. If you look at the equations which you have here, if you look at this one, so this delta, if we now just uh, take that as an intermediate step, this delta can be written out as a vector. And that is something which we would write as a sigma Z of L. But then you will see this kind of dotted notation, which is called the Hadamard multiplication which is the same as an element by element multiplication. So you take element J in a vector which contains the derivative of the activation function times a vector which contains the derivative of the cost function with respect to this IJN. So when you see this notation, it's called a Hadamard multiplication between two vectors. This is a component by component. So it's not an inner product between vectors. That's just a notation in case you have not seen it. This is a kind of notation you will see 
when we are setting up uh, these uh, neural network codes. And this is something you would implement in Python as just a, mate, a multiplication between two vectors. You do, not, you do not put it as an inner product between two vectors, but just the standard multiplication sign. And that does a element by element multiplication. So that was a small technicality. So this is called the Hadamard multiplication. Hadamard multiplication. That was a small technicality. So what we have now, if you go back to the equations we had for the simpler cases last week and in the, in the previous lecture, we have something which is pretty close to what we had earlier. So in the previous case, we had just one hidden layer and then there was a number one here. But this parameter here is essentially the same. So that's a derivative of the cost function. So if you uh, times the derivative of the activation function. So that means that when you have different activation functions, the only thing you need to plug in are the expressions for the derivatives. Okay? So you can hard code these expressions because many of the activation functions are pretty simple. Okay. So that was first step. Now, another thing which you will find immediately, if you look at this DC, DBJ of L, the final one, that is again going to be given by DC of DAJ of L, DAJ of L, of DC of J of L, and then we have DCJ of L of DB, J, L. Now, these equations which you see here are those which we have already defined for layer L. And this one, since the uh, function C is a linear function in terms of B, if we just look back to what we had here, you see now immediately that the derivative with respect to B has to be equal to 1. So that means that the derivatives, that specific gradient, this one, is just equal to one, this part here. So this it becomes equal to delta j of L. Okay, so that's the output layer. And now we have the gradients, which means that we can now set up the update of the gradients. Ij is now being updated with Ij L minus the learning rate. And this is now multiplied with delta J L. And then I have an A of J, of A I, sorry, of L minus one. And then I have my B J for the last layer is now being updated with B J of L minus eta times this delta J of L. So that's the first step. Now we need the uh, derivatives at a later stage. So which means that when we are now setting up, if you go back to the example we had before the break, you saw that we could actually write it out in terms of this function here, delta j of L. So the question is, how do we get that one? So we need that one for all the other layers. And this, uh, is a parameter which we want to express to express in terms in terms of the equations for layer L plus one. So that means that we are going backward now. So we have found the derivatives for the output layer. And now we just want to find the gradients for layer L minus one, L minus two, till we reach the final input, you know, the final first hidden layer. So this again is this exciting uh, uh, applications of the chain rule. So what we are going to do now is simply to set up uh, the equations which we are going to need. So if you now think back to uh, the expressions which we have, so we uh, are going to look at a 
if you see now the parameter delta L, this is a parameter when we write this out in terms of vectors or matrices of DAL of DZL. This is nothing but just the chain rule where we have calculated this quantity here. But we use the chain rule, right? So what we want then is, so if we look at this delta JL, this is nothing but a delta C of, no, sorry, derivative with respect to this quantity here. So what we want is actually delta J of L. But we want to express that in terms of the previous values. So let's take a look at that. And what I want you to do when you revisit these equations, take a look at the example we had with a hidden layer with two nodes. Because that example there gives you the stepping stone towards the expression which comes in the next note here, in the next page. So what we are going to do now is simply to say that this delta J of L is going to be a function of the previous results. And if you go back to the simple case we had before the break, you will see that in that case, you just had one contribution, but here we can have many. So we would have a DC of DCK of L plus one. So we're again using the chain rule, but since we can have many nodes in the simple two by two case, we had only one output node. And then that simplified the equations when we were looking at the derivatives. And then in the, in, in the case which you had here, so this is not that one, but we get D of CK of L plus one. And then I have a DC of JL. Now for the simple case before the break, we had only one output node, which means that this ZK of L plus one was just given by K equal to one. There was only one output. But now since we have many possible outputs from a given, given, given many inputs to a given layer L plus one, then we have to make a sum over all these possibilities. And if you now look at the, the expressions which we had for CJ of L plus one, this one is nothing but I equal one. And then we have the number of nodes in the previous layer. So this is just the expression which we have been seeing again and again, plus a BJ of L plus one. So that means that when I now take the derivatives, I need the following expressions. So if I plug in this one, you will now see that uh, this one is going to give us a delta JL, which is given by a sum over I equal one, no, sorry, a sum over K. And I have a WIJ of L plus one. And I'm going to get my uh, derivatives of AI, no, sorry, a delta K of L plus one times the derivative of the cost function of CJ of L. And what I've used here is that the uh, first term, which I have, if you look at this term here, this is nothing but this term, which you see here from the previous definitions. So if we, if we go back, we have this term here. And that means that this one has to be given by delta K of L plus one. And then I need to take the derivative of this quantity in terms of CJL, but CJL is hidden in here. So that function there is actually a function of CJL. And that means that when I take that derivative, I get the derivative of this one plus this term, which we see here. 
And that's the final expression which we need, because then with this ones, I can now set up the octave rule, which is i, j of L, and that's going to be given by W, i, j of L. This defines my gradients of delta j, L, multiplied with a, i of L minus one. And then I'm going to have the final B, j, L, which is going to be given by minus eta of delta j, L. And these are the expressions which I need to encode in my neural network code. Okay. So let's go back to the, uh, to the slides, unless there are any questions. So let's take a quick look at those eh? and try to summarize a little bit and look at the algorithm which we have to implement. So if we collect all the expression which we found, you will find the same expressions here, as you saw on the whiteboard. And uh, this is just the, uh, essentially the same derivations which you found. And then we have the expression here, and this gives us the final expression. So now we are ready with the equations, we are ready to set up the algorithm. So the first part of the algorithm deals with us defining the architecture, and that's the model. So you need to set up inputs and outputs. You need to uh, define the number of hidden layers and hidden nodes. And normally what people do is that they try to run with the same number of hidden nodes in each hidden layer, but you can change that. But that gives you much more, uh, how to say, uh, many more additional degrees of freedom to explore. Then, you need to define the activation functions. And it's common to keep the same activation functions for all the hidden layers. But keep in mind then that the output function def is defined by the activation function for the output is defined by the type of data you're studying. So if you have a regression problem, you would typically just send out as output what is made by your network. Whereas if you have a classification problem, the binary one, you would say then that if my sigmoid function, for instance, is below 0.5, I output zero. If it's above, I output one. So you need to define the optimizer. So this is what we did in the exercises last week. That's an essential element. Then you need to define cost function and possible regularization terms. You need to initialize weights and biases. And then you need to have a fixed number of iterations for the feed forward and back propagation. So one iteration is one feed forward and one back propagation part. That is one iteration. And typically people would run something like 50 to 100 iterations. And you will see that when you run scikit-learn uh, code for neural networks, Sometimes it will say convergence was not reached with this number of iterations. As you saw when you applied lasso in project number one. So the first thing you do then, you fix the input data and the activation function C1 of the input layer and compute the activation function and the outputs A1. And then you perform the feed forward part till you reach the output layer. So that means that you go through all the layers, one, two, three, to the final one. So in my notation, the first layer, hidden layer, has L equal one, and the final output layer is this uppercase L as we defined. So then we need to compute for the output layer. This is the back propagation. You compute these derivatives, and then you back propagate the error, which is normally called the error, and then you back propagate it, L minus one, L minus two, down to one. And when you do this, so the back propagation algorithm is just an algorithm which finds the expression for the derivatives. So then when you have the derivatives, the gradients, then you do an gradient descent. Obviously, 
if you don't need to do a gradient descent, if you could just use Newton's method and invert the Hessian matrix, you would do that. But this is normally not possible because we are going to have thousands, tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of parameters. So that means that the, the expression you need to set up are these expressions here. And we need to tune the learning rate. And we have these different methods. And then we would update the uh, gradients. So when you update the gradients, uh, you update the weights and the biases. So a requirement to these activation functions. This is another parameter which we need to play around with in the project. So the activation functions make then an important element of the architecture slash model of the neural network. So when I say architecture, this means also the model we are setting up with. So a neural network with a given number of layers, activation functions, etc., that is our model. And typically you would want them to be non-constant, bounded, monotonically increasing, continuous. I should also add, they should have finite derivatives or nice derivatives, which are easy to implement. So, and you will encounter functions like the sigmoid, the hyperbolic tangent, and below here you will find other ones. And if you now run the codes here, what you will see is that the sigmoid function has a behavior which uh, should already now flag some kind of problems. So let me just bring this up here. So as I said, typically what you would do is to say that if it's below a certain value, it outputs zero. And if it's above a certain value, it outputs one. And this threshold is typically 0.5. But if you look at the endpoints here, uh, you see now that when the argument becomes either very negative or very large, then the function flattens out. And there's nothing which hinders you having inputs which can become large. And you see that when it flattens out, since we are calculating derivatives of the activation functions, this will cause problems because it can drive the gradients to zero. So if we now go back to the algorithm, you see now that uh, in the algorithm here, if the gradients are zero, then the training of the weights in the back propagation stage can stop because the gradients are zero. Whereas what you are testing against, you are not testing the value of the gradients. We don't want them to be zero. What we want to be zero is for instance, the mean square error the function we want to optimize, because that's the end product. Alternatively, when you're dealing with a classification, it's the accuracy of uh, your prediction. So if you have 100 data points and you predict correctly 98% or 98, then you have a 98% accuracy. Clearly, you would like to have this one equal one or 100%. So this would be your ideal when you're training the network. It doesn't mean that it will converge to that value because you will have a number of iterations. That means a feed forward stage and a back propagation stage. So you see clearly that in this training, this sigmoid function can actually lead to problems. Another function which people used actually, if you're doing a classification problem is the step function. This has the obvious problem that its derivative is discontinuous. And we don't like that. Uh, other functions, we are coming down to them a little bit later. So you have a sine function, but then we have something which is called the rectified linear unit. So this is extremely simple to implement and it's widely used in neural network training. So something which you will see is also a modified rectified linear unit because below c equals zero, this is set to zero. And that can also lead to problems. So what happens then is that you give it a slight small non-zero uh, sl slope here so that it actually is non-zero also below c equal to zero. This is an extremely popular function, but what you would see then in most uh, applications of neural networks is that people do the training with different activation functions. 
So in the project, you're going to play around with different activation functions because you don't know a priori in the beginning whether this function gives a decent result or not. So if you read through the text here, you have this problem with vanishing gradients. There's also the problem with exploding gradients. And there is a seminal paper. Actually, this paper has some 20,000 citations. So the field of neural network was in a kind of stall in, let's say, the beginning of this millennium because people use the sigmoid function. The sigmoid function has been motivated from neuroscience because it mimics very much the way neurons fire. And it was the most popular function. The problem with the sigmoid function, as Ben Jo and uh, uh, I think and Glorio actually showed back in 2010, was that the sigmoid function could easily lead to exploding gradients. This training of the network uh, in those days was not, how to say, of that impressive type, which we see nowadays. I should also say that the high performance computing uh, facilities, which uh, people had access to, are not on the same level as now, where you can use graphical uh, processing units to, uh, to actually run many of these calculations. So, but in their paper, they studied both the difficulty of training due to the sigmoid, but also the way you initialize the weights and the biases. And that paper is actually worth taking a look at because it tells you a little bit about uh, how the whole field of deep learning never actually took off before after 2010. So we often used to say that the deep learning revolution started around 2010, also with the introduction of convolutional neural networks and other methods, which have been extremely popular, for instance, for image recognition. So take a look at these papers if you uh, uh, want to look a little bit more. And as we said, the derivative of the logistic regression is actually the one which caused problems. And people have then, since then, introduced other functions. One is this uh, ReLU. Another one is called the ELU, which is the exponential linear unit. And again, these, all these functions, they typically introduce new parameters. And then the question is, which activation function should we use? So in general, it seems that this uh, uh, ELO activation works better than the leaky ReLU. So let me say what the leaky ReLU is. So the leaky ReLU means that it has a slight, a small value below C equal to zero, but still given by a straight line. So people tend often by default to use this uh, ELO function and you see that has an additional parameter alpha here. And then it gives normally a slightly better result than this leaky relo, and which again gives a slightly better result than the relo function. But these are things which you need to play around with. So uh, in most cases, uh, you can use this relo function in the hidden layers or one of its variants. It's a bit faster to compute than other activation functions and the gradient descent optimization does in general not get stuck. That is experience from calculations. It may not apply to your case. In a certain sense, it's a little bit disappointing because uh, we are mounting this nice theory uh, based on the universal approximation theorem. And at the end, we just end up tweaking parameters and tweaking activation functions, etc. So the uh, act the uh, universal approximation theorem has only a specific requirement on the function. It doesn't say which function does the best job for you or how many hidden nodes you need or how many hidden layers you need. So that means that uh, we are in a kind of situation where we need to fine tune parameters. The two most important parameters, as you will see, are the learning rates and the hyperparameter lambda, which you had in project one as well. Also, when you're setting up the gradient descent methods, you will need to play around with a different number of epochs and batches. But when you see that typically the results stabilize, you will just run with those number of batches and epochs for the rest of the calculations. And then the major parameters, which we would fine tune, 
as you will see from the codes, which we will discuss next week. So I didn't get time to uh, come to those codes, but the, uh, those codes are actually uh, examples of where we can tune the different parameters. And there are many, many other ways. The uh, one way to avoid uh, the different exploding gradient is to called gradient clipping, which simply means that if the gradient is larger than a certain value, you put it back to a small value, and then you continue training. So there are many such ad hoc rules. And you have this uh, dropout, which I mentioned, if the training becomes too complicated, you train only a subset of the nodes. So you don't have all nodes fully connected. A neural network is, as you have seen now, is what we mathematically call an affine transformation. So you have a matrix with the weights, which you multiply with the inputs from the previous layer. And the matrix is dense, and the vector you multiply with is dense. So we keep the full dimensionality. So if you have 100 nodes in a hidden layer, which connect with 100 nodes in another hidden layer, your matrix has dimensionality 100 times 100. So you have 10,000 matrix elements. And you keep all. In some cases, you can reduce the dimensionality by leaving out half of them, by choosing them randomly, and then doing the training that way. But in general, what we are going to do in project two is that we just keep the dense matrix as it is. So if we now take a, a kind of top-down perspective, uh, there are some limits which we need to think of. And some of this, so just take a look at this uh, uh, points at the end here. So we need labeled data. So a neural network is a typical example of a supervised learning problem. You also, uh, these methods are extremely data intensive, which simply means the more data you have, the better it is, the better your training. And you saw that in project one as well. So what you saw in project one transfers also to neural networks. Also, it requires that we deal with homogeneous data. That means that we cannot have data which vary uh, within just, let's say, one type of feature. And uh, so homogeneous, almost all deep neural networks deal with homogeneous data one type. It's very hard to design architectures that mix and match data types. You can have some continuous variables, some discrete variables, some time series. And in applications beyond typical images, video and language, this is often what is required. Uh, later, towards the end of the semester, we are going to look at uh, ensemble methods like random forest and gradient trees. And that's also uh, something which allows more mixed data types. Uh, many problems are not about prediction. And in natural science, we're often interested in learning something about the underlying distribution that generates the data. In that case, it's often difficult to cast these ideas in a supervised learning setting. So uh, actually defining what is a good model or not is uh, one of the more difficult parts, which we are actually sweeping under the rug in this course. But when you are uh, dealing with real data in your thesis, for instance, then you need really to use all your insight to define what is the best possible model. Okay, so I was hoping to uh, go through the setup of uh, a code here, but I'm going to discuss that next Monday. And then I'm also going to show you how you can use these codes to solve differential equations. And that's a very, very hot topic in the natural sciences, because in some cases you have huge dimensionalities and neural networks have, from experience now, actually beaten many of the standard differential equation solver methods. Like if you're solving Navier-Stokes equations, this is a field where, for instance, you are interested in turbulence, where you need a high resolution of your data, and neural networks actually outbeat standard Navier-Stokes solvers. And that's uh, a field of active research, and it has defined a totally new field, which is called often physics-informed neural networks, where you 
plug in the boundary conditions as part of the optimization problem. So next week, we are going to run through the setup of a, a code, which you can look at and be inspired by when you are writing your code for project two. Uh, alternatively, you can just use elements from it. Uh, that code, the first code deals with uh, classification, which is the second part of project number two. And the final code, there are two codes here. The final code uh, is an object-oriented variant of everything, where you use autograd, and you can see how you could implement that one as well. But the exercises this week, and also next week, deal with us setting up feedforward and backpropagation. So my, uh, how to say, I don't like to tell people what they should do. I hate that. But my uh, advice now is take a look at these simple examples with a scalar in, scalar out, one hidden layer, two nodes in hidden layer, two input, inputs, and set up the equations for the neural network with backpropagation. Because that's something which makes it easier to understand what you need to program when you set up the feed forward and the backpropagation part. Okay, any questions? I wanted to ask you many more questions, but we will leave that for the lab sessions. Okay, guys. Thanks for coming.